feet. It's one mile. It's almost a mile, but you, you just, just picture that. That's almost a quarter, though, a mile with the, with the water standing if they're going between. It's kind of scary, too. Picture a thousand feet, water on a, a gauntlet of water on each side. And the Lord manifested the church of Israel his wonders of Egypt in the sea, and by hand, Moses and Aaron. And when the children of Israel had entered the sea, oh, this is what I wanted to read you. Before, I'm going to put a pause here. I'm going to read this fast. Hopefully I got it. I told you I was going to uh, tell you this battle wasn't just between Pharaoh and God, but also the principalities that ruled Egypt, the evil demonic enemies that was replicated in the, in the statues that they bowed to, that they served, was also God was challenging. He was challenging Ra and Adam, the, the sun god. With the plagues. God answered all these gods with those ten plagues. He darkened the sun. Remember, he caused three days dark and show he controlled the sun. Shu is what we're dealing with now, the, the god of the wind. God showed he had mastered the wind, used the wind to split the Red Sea. And that's, and then you're going to see later why the uh, Egyptians followed him. They thought the god was, Shu was working for them to set them up to be killed in a trap in the, in the Red Sea and they can go out and let them drown. Nepne and Nut, male and female god and goddess, quote unquote of Egypt, the demon gods, was a god of the weather. God, remember he rained down, one was hot and one was cold, one was for heat, and one was for icy weather, colder weather. God showed he had mastery of both. He, when he rained, he rained fire mingled with hell, cold and hot. Show he's over both. That was the answer these two um, brother and sister guys right here, quote unquote. He showed that he, uh, Ged, the god of the crops and over, over the reptiles, the frogs, that's what that was about. And God destroyed the crops and brought frogs all up on the land and made them stink, made the land stink with reptiles. And also I think the same God had a part to play with the, the earth. God brought lice up from the dust of the ground because the priest was very, very meticulous and clean because they performed their rituals in these temples, not to get any dust or dirt on them. They believed that God, that God of theirs protected them from getting dirty as well. Os Osiris, crops. Like I said, God destroyed the fruit trees, the crops, they, they was all divine that up. Those pagan God, Isis was over healing. And um, the babies, God destroyed them. And you have Nephis over the air, God. And then in the Nile River, God turned that to blood. Set the God of chaos and war. That's who they was going to battle under. I'm sure they did a few rituals that they took off. And how Seth gave them the victory, the God drowned them in the Red Sea. God's the God of war too. See, but he is the God, he said. False God, but I thought I'd throw that in free. I told you I was supposed to read that to you last time during the plagues. But I didn't know. Uh, I didn't get around to it. All right. And the children of Israel entered the sea, and the Egyptians came after them. And the waters of the sea returned upon them, and they all sank in the water. Now God said, 
before he drowned in the, in the Bible that he knocked the wheels off of them. So they dragged. So they, like I said, they were 60 miles an hour. But they couldn't, but God knocked them away and they found those wheels. Biblical archaeology, Ron Wyatt and his team over almost three decades ago, I would guess, found those chariot wheels just where God said they were in the, in the Red Sea, which should send chills up and down the so-called skeptics, atheists, uh, pessimistic, doubting scientists, backs. Thus said the word of the Lord is an absolute fact. And they traced them wheels right back to the, the 15th century BC dynasty, which were placed in right at 1446 BC, the Exodus, the date of the Exodus, which correlates with so much, including the Egyptians' own records that they had noted the Exodus on there, of course they would. They wanted to get the Israelites out of there, all the havoc they reaped and all the thousands of people that were killed by these plagues of God, including the first one. So they, of course they kept accurate records. Fourteen, this is right. The Bible is an absolute fact. The most accurate history book on earth. And biblical archaeology has improved it a million times over now. It's just too much to go over right now. We'd be spending weeks, not months, covering all the discoveries that backs up dust said the word of the Lord. From Noah's Ark to Sodom and Gomorrah to you can go on the uh, Eno Fair Tales. They done found the Ark, they done found everything. They done found biblical cities they thought, including cities of David, they thought was myth. They done found the lie skull with a hole in it. They done found the, his uh, tomb there. The giant, the lion. It's not a fairy tale book. It's a book of facts. And we quote this story here, we read. And Pharaoh, who gave thanks, and and the children of Israel had entered the sea. The Egyptians came after them, and the waters of the sea returned upon them, and they all sank in the water, and not one man was left, excepting Pharaoh, who gave thanks to the Lord and believed in him. Therefore the Lord did not cause him to perish. So he had a Saul the Paul moment and did not cause him to perish at the time with the Egyptians. And the Lord ordered an angel to take him from amongst the Egyptians who cast him up on the land of Nineveh. And he reigned over it for a long time. Somebody need to look that up. That Pharaoh coming to them. Don't need biblical archaeologists. And on the day that the Lord saved Israel from the hand of Egypt, and all the children of Israel saw that the Egyptians had perished, they beheld the great hand of the Lord in what he had performed in Egypt in the sea. Then sang Moses and the Egyptians of the Israel this song unto the Lord on the day when the Lord caused the Egyptians to fall before them. And Israel sang in concert. Now, in the biblical version, Miriam, Moses' sister, grabbed grabbed a tambourine and started singing this. And Pharaoh sank like a, like a stone to the bottom of the sea. She was at it. Nobody was crying because they died. Everybody was celebrating. <laughs> Everybody felt sorry for the Egyptians. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord on the day when the Lord caused the Egyptians to fall before them. And all Israel sang in concert, saying, I will sing to the Lord for he is greatly exalted. The horse and his rider was cast into the sea. Behold, it is written in the book of the law of God. After this, the children of Israel proceeded on their journey and encamped in Mar. And the Lord gave to the children of Israel statutes and judgments in the place of Mara. And the Lord commanded the children of Israel to walk in all his ways and to serve him. And they journeyed from Mara, which means bitter, and came to Elam. And Elam were twelve springs of water. They found those twelve springs of archaeologists 
and the um, the, and the uh, palm trees, the oasis, and the seventy day trees, and the children they can they're still there. There by the waters, the waters still there too. And they journeyed from Eden and came to the wilderness of Sin on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departure from Egypt. At the time the Lord gave manna to the children of Israel to eat. And the Lord caused food to rain from heaven for the children of Israel day by day. They can only eat enough manna for that day in daily faith. And the children of Israel ate the manna for 40 years. All the days that they were in the wilderness until they came to the land of Canaan to possess it. And they proceeded from the wilderness of sin and encamped in Elish. And they proceeded from Elish and camped in Rephidim. And when the children of Israel were in Rephidim, Amalek, the son of Eliphaz, the son of Esau, the son of Zopho, came to fight with Israel. And he brought with him 801,000 men, magicians and conjurers. And he prepared for battle with Israel in Rephidim. And they carried on a great and severe battle against Israel. And the Lord delivered Amalek and his people into the hand of Moses and the children of Israel and unto the hand of Joshua, the son of Nun, the Ephraite, the servant of Moses. And the children of Israel smote Amalek and his people at the edge of the sword, but the battle was very sore upon the children of Israel. And the Lord said unto Moses, Write this thing as a memorial for in the book, and to place it in the hand of Joshua, the son of Nun, thy servant. And thou shalt command the children of Israel, saying, When thou shalt come, to the land of Canaan, thou shalt utterly Ephes it. Thou shalt show the utterly Ephes, the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven, erased in memory. And Moses did so, and he took the book and wrote up on it the words saying, Remember Amalek has done unto thee and the road which thou wentest forth from Egypt, who met thee in the road and smote thy rear. Even those that were feeble, all the handicapped, feeble, slow moving people, Amalek killed behind thee when thou was faint and weary. Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God shall have given thee rest from all thy enemies round about in the land where the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to you to possess it, that thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under the heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. And the king who shall have pity on Amalek or upon his memory that was Saul. Saul had pity on him. God killed Saul. Or God himself to be killed upon the memory of upon his seed. Behold, I will require of him. And I will cut him off from amongst his people. That happened. And Moses wrote all these things in a book and enjoined the church of Israel respecting all these things and matters. God had a latter day to wipe out Amalek from totally from under the sun, being annihilate, genocide, his whole people, babies, women, children, cattle. They was to be God's executioners of Amalek and wipe him totally out, leave nothing and burn him. And Saul didn't do that. David took David to dot God's eyes across his teeth, but by then some of them had escaped. And the children of Israel proceeded from Rephidim, and they encamped in the wilderness of Sinai in the third month from the going down from Egypt. And at that time came Ruel, the Midianite, the father-in-law of Moses, with Zephor, his daughter, and her two sons. For he had heard of the wonders of the Lord which he had done in Israel, that he had delivered them from the hand of Egypt. And Ruel came to Moses, to the wilderness where he encamped, where was the mountain of God. Now they didn't, Ron Wyatt discovered that mountain of God in Mount Sinai. And it's in Arabian Desert. And it's the Mount Horeb, the same Mount Horeb, that's Mount of Sin, 
They done found it. The mountain is black and burnt at the top, and that's where God resided, up on top of that mountain. It's still black and burnt to this day, and they found uh, Hebrew symbols and engravings, like they found articles from the, like this um, seven golden candlestick carved into the rocks, and in Hebrew, letting them know they were there. They also found the graves of those 3,000 that Moses had killed at the foot of the mountain. Tell you, biblical archaeology proved the word, and he found the rock where the water that Moses had split a rock with the staff, symbolizing Christ's death. He was to strike the rock once, only one. God got mad, and he lost the promised land because his anger got between him and God. We're dealing with those people, he struck it twice. God, that was symbol of Christ. He was only to strike it once. In water, they found it was huge vast mount of uh, water that gushed down that mountain it gave water and cut literally a, um, a stream a gully of water that fed two and a quarter million people and it was huge you could see the rocks were smooth on one side and then on the other side of that rock it was jagged and rough so that you know it was a huge bottom of water that came down, millions of gallons that came down that mountain and, uh, and cut a swath of the land out with, you know, how powerful water is. But where that place is, is arid and dry. There shouldn't be no water of that volume running down the mountain there. But it's coming from that rock. It's a huge rock too. Rock is like a monster rock. I don't know. Probably weighs over a hundred tons. It's how big this rock is. And I know it stands up at least 50 feet. But you can see the split, the fissure in the rock from where the water flowed from that rock. Just one more feather in the cap for God for proof that this book is not a fairy tale book. We can go on and on. Told you. We've been doing this for weeks proving the Bible's most accurate book history book on earth. When Zipporah's daughter and her two sons, for he had heard of the wonders of the Lord, okay, here comes the father-in-law, and rule came to Moses to the wilderness where he encamped, where it was a mountain of God. And Moses went forth to meet his father-in-law with great honor, and all Israel with him. And rule and his children remained among the Israelites for many days. And rule knew the Lord from, the, from that day forward. And in the third month from the children of Israel's departure from Egypt, and on the sixth day thereof, the Lord gave to Israel the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai. And all Israel heard all these commandments. And all Israel rejoiced exceedingly in the Lord on that day. And the glory of the Lord rested upon Mount Sinai. And he called to Moses, only Moses could come up that mountain. As a matter of fact, Moses told him to cordon that mountain off, secure that mountain, put barricades around it. Because if you was getting near that mountain and even touched that mountain, you would have to die. God would kill you right away. Only Moses and, and uh, Joshua and Aaron was allowed on that mountain. And Moses came, but they couldn't go up with Moses. And Moses, not at this point, I think Aaron went up much later. And Moses and Aaron came in the midst of the cloud and ascended the mountain. And then, oh, see, yeah, I was right. And Moses was up on the mountain. And Moses was up on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. He ate no bread and drank no water. Now, you in a desert climate, be like me being out here, death out, and don't drink any water. Or any, eat any food for 40 days, I'm dead. So obviously God sustained him. And the Lord instructed him in the statutes and judgments in order to teach the children of Israel. And the Lord wrote the Ten Commandments, which he had commanded the children of Israel upon the two tablets of stone, which he gave Moses to command the children of Israel. And at the end of 40 days and 40 nights, when the Lord had finished speaking to Moses, on Mount Sinai, 
Then the Lord gave to Moses the tablets of stone written with the finger of God. God wrote it with his own fingers. Thou in stone shalt not murder. <laughs> Thou shalt not kill. He wrote all the Ten Commandments. Now you know that finger had to be something. We're talking granite, by the way. The hardest stone. What no sandstone, something soft. So that's the power of God. To etch that in stone with his finger. He wrote the Ten Commandments. I mean, it's just certain things I, I just like I stopped and it came in amazement. How powerful God will be. To take his finger and write it. So you try. You, you try writing in stone with your finger and see how far you get. And you will appreciate what I'm trying to tell you. Okay, where was I at? Um, and at the end of 40 days and nights, the Lord had finished speaking to Moses on Mount Sinai. Then the Lord gave to Moses the tablets of stone written with the finger of God. And when the children of Israel saw that Moses tarried to come down from the mount, they gathered around Aaron and said, As for this man, they said that with this thing, as for this man, Moses, we know not what has become of him. They couldn't control Moses, but here they give him a teaching of Brother Aaron, the, pre the people's pastor. Now they wanted the pastor they could control the congregation. And therefore, rise up and make us a God. Create us a religion that is palatable to us. Create a religion that we can micromanage. You know, see, we can't control this God. And we sure can't control Moses, that's serving. So you create us, Pastor Aaron, a church that we can go to that suits our flesh with lust and desires. There's no threat to us. And that we can control. We can control this idol, religion. That's what you got in Christianity right now. I say maybe 90 some percent. Maybe 95, I don't know. You said Christianity is idolatrous. It's a golden cat. It's a God that don't exist. They done watered God down, diluted him down, sugar-coated him down, prosperity him down. He done become a, an amorous, amorphous mass of cotton candy. <laughs> Sitting on the throne. He inspires no fear. He's the God that took me to hellfire. No, not that one. I don't fear that one. They, they, they're, <laughs> they're promoted. But that's what this is. This is what you're looking at right now. This is... Uh, New Age religion. This is the Masonic 33 and 3rd Brotherhood uh, religion, Christianity, the Mass. This is um, the Witch, Madame Velasquez, New Age. This is Elwan Hubbard's Dianetics. This is a, a dash of Takama Buddha and his Eightfold Path. Kundalini Magic. Christianity. This is a hodgepodge of new age occultic beliefs catering toward the flesh of man. That's what you got now. And man is mixed in there. Demon of greed. Stadiums filled with greedy people following greedy preachers. They turn God into a, a giant slot machine. A giant Vegas slot machine. Pay to play. Have to pay to play. Put them ties into that slot machine to get cash out. By the uh, Prosperity Casino pimp owners. And Aaron was greatly afraid for the people. He's afraid of the people instead of afraid of God. And he ordered, he just said, man, I, you got to kill me. I ain't about to build you no care. Go ahead and kill me. God can raise me up. And he ordered them to bring it, bring him to go. And he made it into a molding calf for the people. And the Lord said unto Moses, before he had done come down from the mount, get thee down 
for thy people they didst bring forth from Egypt. He said thy people that you brought forth from Egypt. God, God ain't even claiming them. He said these your people ain't my people. These your people you brought forth. He ain't God. He couldn't bring them through the Red Sea. God did all that. God said it's your people. These people ain't mine. I ain't claiming these people. You still very hard headed bunch. Get thee down, thy people, whom thou didst bring forth from Egypt. They have corrupted themselves. They have made to themselves a molten calf. They made a religion that they can carry around in their back pocket. And have bowed down to it, worship it. Now, therefore, now, he's up there giving them the law, thou shalt not have no other gods before thee. You should have bow down to them, you should have no other idols. No statues you bow down to and kiss and none of that stuff. No. It's adultery. No religion that you manufacture. We I said go to tell to be what a lot of Christians have done anyway in, in their heads. Creator of God that don't exist. A God of all love. No God of wrath. A God that'll a Jesus that's hard up that'll take anybody like a beggar into the kingdom with his hat in his hand. The old I stand it or not. Not the king of kings and lord of lords. That you'd be so lucky that if he did call you to get on this battlefield and wage war against Satan and his minions to push the gates of hell back. That's what we're supposed to be doing as an army of the Lord. Not being praying madnesses, waiting extinct in the uh, rapture. Best believe that's going to be for the remnant of war. Those troops will be taken out. But for the cowards that want to be ostriches and stick their head in the sand, you'll be left here to deal with the Antichrist. Since you pretty much done giving yourselves over in your own heart to them anyway, by going along with their little junior Antichrist agendas instead of resisting. We're supposed to be solid and light, pushing the Antichrist agenda back. And the Lord said unto Moses, Behold, he had come down from the mount. Get thee down for thy people, which thou didst bring forth from Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have made to themselves a molten calf. The apex bull of Tom was the Antichrist religion, false religion. It's what's being worshipped in the churches now, not the real Christ, but the Antichrist. Even your Christmas that you keep in your What's that on an Easter? All these are pagan early days celebrating Antichrist. Via Rome. And have bowed down to them. Now therefore leave me that I may consume them from off the earth. I'll wipe out two and a quarter million right now. Raise up some rocks, Moses, from this desert and we'll continue on. We don't need these people. Well, they are stiff necked people. God is really mad. And when God gets mad, the Bible says he's a consuming fire. So you don't want him boiling in front of you because you will get wiped out. I mean, the hills are testing morning to his power over fire, hell fire. Been there, had no problem, had no, uh, no reason to go back, no desire. One trip was enough. Set me straight for life. That's what we about about here, street priest, teaching the fear, old fashioned fear of the Lord to help you depart from evil. They helped me and there are many others that have been here. And Moses besought the countenance of the Lord, and he prayed to the Lord for the people on account. Now Moses make an intercessory. Don't wipe them out, Lord. Remember your enemies, what they're gonna say. They say you brought them out here to kill them. On account of the calf which they have made. And afterward he descended from the mount. Moses said, Let me handle this, Lord. Don't wipe them out. And his hands were two tablets of stone, which God had given him to command the Israelites. And when Moses approached the camp and saw the calf, which the people had made, the anger of Moses was kindled, and he broke the tablets under the mouth. <laughs> God took his time and wrote these out in his own finger, and Moses just smashes them in a second. But that, that went along with God's prophetic uh, type and shadows. Adam and Eve broke God's first law. They had broke 
God's written commandments the first time around. The first set was broken. God broke man's law and sin. Paul was saved. So God didn't get mad at Moses for that. But Moses did something down the road where God commanded him to only do it once. And he got to strike that rock once and brought forth the water symbol of Christ. It is death being struck with death. And by the and that staff symbolizes power over death and being raised up and water to come forth the Holy Spirit out of a dry rock, a smitten rock. Moses mowed it twice because he got so pissed off at the people. And he was the guy in the promised land because of it. People got to him by it. He made him go overboard with God. Because he was interfering with God's prophetic plan. This didn't interfere with it. And him breaking them down. Looked like God would got mad. I said, man, you didn't you see me write this down with my finger? What's wrong with you breaking them down? Are you crazy, bro? You get mad at them. You should have set them tablets down and got them. Did not break my tablets. And Moses came to the camp and he took the calf and burned it with fire. Now Moses got a little fiery temper too, don't forget. Yeah, he started out killing an Egyptian, burning an Egyptian and burying and ground it until it became fine dust and strolled it up on the water and gave it to the Israelites to drink. They, they drank gold dust uh, soup. <laughs> and when they died, and they died of the people by the sword of each other. God turned the swords on each other. About 3,000 men who had made the calf. And on the morrow, Moses said to the people, I will go up to the Lord, maybe I may atone for your sins, which you have sinned to the Lord. And Moses again went up to the Lord, and he remained with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights, another 40 days and 40 nights. And during the 40 days, he did, did Moses entreat the Lord on behalf of the children of Israel. And the Lord hearkened to the prayer of Moses, and the Lord was entreated of him on behalf of Israel. He got, Moses got God's ear. Then spake the Lord to Moses to hew two stones of tablet. Now you got to start over, Moses. You broke those, now get the work and chisel out of another. 